to see if we could commit to a shared agenda with respect to more open, equitable scholarship in the social sciences. That meeting explored how we might work together to increase access to social science research and ensure that scholars and scholarship thrive in an environment that is inclusive, equitable, trustworthy, and durable. And we found, not surprisingly, that we had shared interest in a number of areas, including sustainable infrastructure, quality and effectiveness of scholarship, and access. Today's presentation uh, digs into the area of shared interest around institutional roles. So specifically, the importance of scholarly affiliation with institutions, with societies, and with other communities, and how those affiliations are challenged by new business models and new economic realities of higher education. So some, just a few issues that that meeting surfaced. Um, societies rely on membership dues in an environment with declining majors and increasing adjunctification of faculty. They rely on conference revenue in places that are often expensive to get to, or in 2020, impossible to get to. And subscription revenue from journals that provide operational funds for other non-publishing activities. Research libraries, on the other hand, have strained budgets, are generally supportive of society activities, but would like to see that support separated from subscription costs, and would like to see the rest of the academic institution contribute. So these are real challenges for all of us today, um, and made immeasurably worse by COVID. Uh, and so we really want to invite everyone here um, in the audience um, into this conversation through the chat and the Q&A after the panel. Today's discussion is about a report that we published in October of last year called Affiliation and Transition, Rethinking Society Membership with Early Career Researchers in the Social Sciences. ARL commissioned this paper from Marcella Flum to apply social science thinking to some of our shared challenges and potential collaborative solutions, specifically by interviewing early career researchers and where they invest their time and derive community and belonging in their scholarship. After Marcel presents his work, we have a fantastic panel of reactors who will help us explore how research libraries and societies can support community building among early career researchers. We are really pleased to have with us Dania Glavo, an early career scholar at NYU, Dylan Rodriguez, president of the American Studies Association and a professor at UC Riverside, and Elaine Westbrooks, vice provost and university librarian at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I will put their bios in the chat momentarily. Um, as we all try to navigate to more open, equitable knowledge creation and distribution, our question today is what can we learn from listening to the voices of early career scholars? Before I turn this over to Marcel, I wanna let you know that this conversation is governed by the ARL Code of Conduct, which I'll also put in the chat. Uh, Marcel is currently a postdoctoral researcher at LBG Open Innovation and Science Center in Vienna, Austria. He'll present for about 15 minutes before we bring in our panel for discussion. So over to you, Marcel. Perfect. <clears throat> thanks so much, Judy, and, and thanks to all of you who are, are joining us today or, or listening to the recording um, later on. Um, yeah, I've got some slides that I'll share here. Great. So as Judy said, so the, the title of the report, Affiliation in Transition, um, I'll say a little about the work that the idea of affiliation is doing there. And I think that's something we can talk a bit about. So, so how um, membership in a, a scholarly society is, is one way, although not the only way, um, that early career researchers um, look for um, belonging and, and engagement with each other. Um, so, you know, again, just a, a little about me. I mean, I, I have a background um, in libraries and also in the social sciences, in anthropology. Um, and as I'll talk a bit about, uh, you know, my, my uh, experiences here are, are based um, in part in, in my work with society publishing um, and, and really thinking about societies um, from the inside in that way, um, as, as these spaces that, that, as Judy said, really reflect um, the, the new challenges and the, the sort of evolving environment for scholarship um, that, that we see today, um, and, and that, that these institutions are, are um, evolving in order to, to serve and to, and to meet those changing needs. 
So, you know, I mean, the, the one way of talking about the background for this report are, are sort of these kind of headlines um, that, you know, that are, that are structural in nature, right? So we can think about the transition to open access and the, the pressure that it places on traditional revenue, revenue models. Um, we can think about the, the changing structure of the scientific workforce, so the way in which early career researchers today are really navigating kind of changing expectations about um, the, the kind of employment that they, they can expect to engage in um, as, as they move into that workforce. Um, you know, I mean, societies are part of a, a wider sort of um, culture and society in which our, our, you know, our patterns of engagement with organizations from, you know, the, the bowling leagues that, that folks like Robert Putnam talk about, um, to churches, to political parties, there's a way in which, you know, the way that we join um, organizations and belong to organizations is itself changing, and that's not limited to scholars, right? That's not, that's not only scholars. Um, so those, those patterns are also something that, that scholarly organizations are having to contend with. Um, and of course, as, as Judy said, I mean, this, this past year has, has placed, um, you know, a, a whole different set of, of um, challenges and, and also invited innovations in various ways from, from scholarly organizations about what it means to convene in new ways, um, you know, in these particular conditions of constraint that we find ourselves under, but posing the question, right, of, of um, you know, if, if there is something like a new normal after this, then, then what are the elements of, of this period that, that will have taught us something and, and that, that, that we'll wanna keep, that we'll wanna carry forward? So again, I mean, these are, these are sort of the headlines. This is kind of the structural picture. Um, but I also think about, I, I'm an anthropologist by training. And, and so I, I think of a particular moment where I, I was sort of in conversation with an early career researcher that got me thinking along these lines. Um, so for, for four years, I, I co-managed a, a volunteer program for early career researchers as part of a scholarly society. Um, and so we were at a, a you know, a breakfast event um, with this, this group of volunteers. So there were, you know, 20, 25 um, current PhDs and, and, and um, recent graduates in a kind of hotel ballroom. Um, so, you know, we were talking about the, the program and the work that we were engaged with together. Um, and, and the question that came up in the, in the context of, I think, whether it should be required to be a member or not to sort of be, to be part of this program, um, but I'll, I'll just, you know, the, the question that has really stayed with me now, kind of going on three years later, um, from a current PhD student who asked um, just this, so why would I need to be a member in the first place? Um, and, and so I think we can take a question like this in a few ways, right? So I think one is maybe with a bit of, of irritation, right? So I, I think uh, there's a way in which, you know, this student was you know, uh, enjoying the bagel and the coffee that the society was providing for, for this event. And, and you know, I, I think there's a way in which um, at times, the right, I, I think it's easy to feel as though the services that societies provide, um, I don't know, people don't understand them well enough, people aren't appropriately kind of, um, yeah, grateful for them or sort of accessing the, the ways in which they, they are really intended to, to help. Right, so that's that's one layer. Um, often, I think the response to a question like this is a really kind of information-driven one, um, or, or one about persuasion. Right, so it, it's a way of saying, um, you know, providing a list of benefits, right, of, of individual benefits that that membership might might provide, or sort of giving an account of the good work that an organization is doing out in the world. Um, and, and right, there's the, the idea that if we could just message the activities that 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 our, our organizations are engaged in well enough and persuasively enough, then this question would go away, right? That it's just sort of a, a gap in understanding. Um, but for me as an ethnographer, I mean, I, I really tried to take this question as a as a prompt to thought, right? And, and to ask. Um, you know, why the student was, was in the room at all, 
right? And was, was part of this collective, part of this sort of volunteer program, even as she was pursuing her studies. And if the category of membership didn't make sense to her, right? If it wasn't evident to her what, yeah, how, how participation in a learned society on those terms um, was, was, was valuable, then what might it mean to follow earlier career scholars like this into the networks and the alternative spaces of affiliation um, that they are engaged in, right? So, so this is someone who had showed up early on a Saturday morning to, to engage with other, other scholars, other, other peers. Um, and, and so to try to sort of understand the terms on which um, this, this student and other early career scholars are seeking out those forms of connection, um, even as they don't always map onto the, the categories and the forms of organizational engagement that, that might be laid out for them, um, that, that might be the sort of received structures that, that we're working within. So, you know, the, the term affiliation, again, that I, I is sort of at the, the heart of this paper, is my effort to think through the gap between membership in that sort of formal kind of dues paying sense, um, and what I think of as, as pattern social action expressing investment in a collectivity and what it potentiates. Right? So there's a way in which formal membership in an organization may be one form that affiliation takes, um, but it may not be the only form. There may be forms of investment that operate alongside or sort of athwart that particular um, yeah, mode of, 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 of membership. Um, and what does it mean for organizations that don't, un don't understand themselves to have members at all? Right? How is it that some of these other networks may have different metaphors, different, different ways of, of relating to scholars and scholarship such that membership as a category, um, yeah, may not, may not capture everything that we want to understand. So, I mean, if I, if I can kind of give you the, the takeaway of the report just very briefly in, in, in one slide, um, I would say it's this. So, I mean, the, the findings of the study, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about the folks who I, who I talked to and, and where these findings are coming from. Um, but, you know, in some ways, scholarly societies are becoming less successful at laying claim to those affiliative investments of earlier career researchers relative to some of these other emerging spaces of scholarly affiliation. And, you know, on the one hand, that can be cause for concern, right? So for societies themselves, but also for, for scholarship, for research organizations. Um, yeah, th there's a way in which that, you know, this, this might give us cause for, for concern. But the other side of this that I wanna emphasize is that societies can learn from and cooperate with these alternative spaces um, in order to renew their own mission, right? Of supporting scholars and scholarship. Um, and also in ways that move toward this more open, diverse, and participatory system of, of scholarly communication um, with which Judy sort of opened today. So yeah, I, I guess what I really want to emphasize is that this, um, this sense of a, you know, uh, ways in which societies um, are, are well positioned, I think, to learn from um, and to engage with these alternative spaces, which need uh, the the you know the the, the support and the infrastructural um, solidity that that these these societies can often provide, right? So I, the, there are things that we can learn from these alternative spaces, and yet you know I, I think there are ways that these alternative spaces need to be capacitated on their own terms, and I think that both societies and libraries have a role to play in 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 seeing that 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 comes about. So again, I mean, I will belabor this. I'm happy to, to answer more questions ab about it. Um, but, but the findings of the study are based on interviews with 12 early career researchers in the social sciences um, from the United States and Canada. Um, so a, a range of fields um, of, of uh, identities in terms of gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, and yeah, I mean, when I think about the sampling strategy here, I, I should be very clear that, that this is not a representative sample of society members and that that was never the intent of the study. Um, but but the, the intention was to identify people who are really engaged in, in creating, 
um, or, or in bringing about these alternative spaces of affiliation from which societies may have a chance to, to learn. Um, that's not to say that, that, uh, that every society member or every early career researcher in the social sciences is, is engaged in that work, not at all. And, and the report touches on, on some ways in which, you know, some, some reasons that that might be so. Um, but if we think about the purpose of the report in terms of this idea of listening for weak signals that could become strong, right? These emerging forms of affiliation that are not yet dominant, um, but that represent a direction in which um, researchers, uh, you know, early career researchers and their needs are sort of trending. I think that's the, that's the value in trying to understand these spaces. So the, the report sort of has four main findings, which I'll, I'll talk through briefly. Um, so the first sort of restates this, this, this idea, this gap between membership and affiliation that, that I'm referring to. Um, so the way in which membership in existing societies is only one site of belonging and engagement. So the report documents um, other, other networks, um, both place-based um, that, are, that are specific to, to where researchers are, are located, um, but also more diffuse and um, enabled by information communication technologies. Um, so I think first and foremost, it's just important for us to understand this, right? That, that, um, that, that researcher community can be sort of channeled through this, this particular form, but that's not the only way that it happens. Um, and, and that it can be valuable to describe those other forms to sort of take an inventory of them. So the second finding that the, the desire for alternative spaces of affiliation is widespread. So I think sometimes this can come from a, a sense of needs not being met by, by existing scholarly societies in, in various ways. Um, but I think also by a sense that Alternative spaces of affiliation offer early career researchers an opportunity to make an impact, to, to be involved in priority setting for, for the organizations that they're part of um, from the very beginning, right? And from the point in the, in the career cycle where they are. So there's, there's perhaps less of a sense that they need to wait in line for, for years, um, to, to sort of qualify for a board position or, or a, another role where their voice would really be taken seriously. Um, like part of what is attractive about these alternative spaces is really the chance to, to shape those priorities um, from, from the beginning. Um, the third finding, I mean, we can think about these alternative spaces as, as more loosely institutionalized than um, than existing scholarly societies. And I think something that, that for me as a researcher was really helpful to understand about them um, is that the goal of these spaces is not always to scale up, is not always to, um, to achieve permanence or to, yeah, necessarily to, to displace kind of other legacy organizations. Um, I mean, part of, part of what is interesting about them, I think, um, is this sense that they, they can exist for a period of time, but also remain flexible to sort of change, to, um, yeah, to, to, to blink out of existence in one form and reemerge in another as the needs of the researchers who are, are steering them um, change or are, are understood more clearly. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a piece where I, I think using the logic of, um, of, of existing scholarly societies or other nonprofit organizations can, can limit us here um, if, we, if we try to apprehend these alternative spaces on exactly the same terms. Um, the, the fourth and final finding um, is that early career researchers balance what I've called strategic and symbolic investments in existing societies. And I think that's, un that's important to understand um, also in relation to the needs that these alternative spaces might meet. Um, so, you know, the way in which showing up to a meeting because it's where the job market happens or um, because membership is an expectation for certain kinds of professional advancement, um, you know, that, that strategic element is there. Um, but it was very clear in the interviews that there are sort of symbolic investments in these, uh, in these institutions. 
um, and particularly in kind of claiming them for certain kinds of intellectual and political projects, right? The way in which these organizations represent a, a kind of solidity of, of these disciplines um, in ways that, that, that early career researchers talk about wanting to gain access to and, and to help sort of steer those organizations and, and the disciplines themselves um, in, in new and, and productive directions. So the report presents a, a set of, of recommendations for both libraries and for societies. I, I won't sort of go through them at, at length, um, but I think on the library front, um, really thinking about the way that scholarly societies, um, again, are, are, are one important site of community for, for scholars and for disciplines, um, but, but for libraries to think about a kind of level playing field where you know, knowing as we do that that these scholarly communities are proliferating, I think there there is an opportunity for libraries to ask, you know, which scholarly communities really align with um, with the sorts of values that that libraries and and other folks within the scholarly communication ecosystem um, are are seeking to advance. Um, you know, how can libraries really make those values clearly heard? Um, and and to to understand that there are communities that are that are really eager to align themselves with them. Um, we can also talk about, as Judy mentioned, sort of thinking about alternative forms of support for scholarly communities, right? So so is it always uh, and only libraries that 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 um, that provide the support through the very specific mechanism of of journal subscriptions, or or you know how are scholarly co communities capacitated um, in in different ways? Um, as well as the range of services that libraries can, can provide um, to scholarly communities of all kinds. When we think about societies in, in, in particular, again, sort of opportunities to coordinate with, to capacitate emerging communities. Um, a nice quote from one of the interviews that I wanted to share um, from an interviewee talking about a particular society um, and, and its relationship to these emerging networks. She says, it's like collaboration between friends, not collaboration between a parent and a child. So I think this idea of, of um, yeah, how these organizations um, or, or how these networks can, can be seen as, as valuable in their own right um, and, and, and really, um, yeah, sort of, uh, you know, not, not taking their lack of institutionalization as a sort of deficit, but rather as sort of a different form, a different, a different structure of network um, that's valuable to, to take on its own terms. Um, so happy to talk more about the, the recommendations. Maybe I'll, I'll leave it here and, and kick it over to my fellow panelists. For me, yeah, maybe the, the closing question I would pose, um, you know, how do we support scholars and scholarship as needs change? And how do we design structures that are fit for this purpose, right? And that's a challenge for societies. That's a challenge for libraries. And it's certainly a challenge for these emerging spaces of affiliation where early career researchers are sort of thinking through this question themselves as it sort of describes the, the changing conditions that they themselves are living through. Um, so I'll leave it there. Just uh, thanks so much and, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Marcel. That was great. Um, so yeah, I think maybe we'll start where you ended about asking how we support early career scholars um, and changing needs. And I'll just ask the panel um, about, you know, just to start maybe by talking about your experience with alternative spaces of affiliation, um, sort of outside of more formal membership organizations. And Danya, maybe we'll start with you. And if you could just, I put your bio in the chat, but if you just wanna say who you are. Sure. Again, I'm Dania Glabo. Hello, everyone. I'm an industry assistant professor at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Hello, my colleagues who are watching today. Um, and uh, I direct the science and technology studies program there. Um, I've also um, have been involved uh, in different kinds of leadership roles with the American Anthropological Association, specifically the Society for Medical Anthropology since 2014, when I was a graduate student. Um, pretty continuously. So, um, I, you know, I, I have the kind of institutionalized um, uh, affiliations, um, but I've also, um, through the end of grad school, post PhD, and, and kind of transitioning to my current role, I've been kind of in and out of academia in various ways. 
Um, at the same time, really um, placing a lot of value on the kind of um, depth of thought, scholarship, and care uh, that my colleagues in uh, who are still in grad school or in traditional academic roles brought to their work. And, and that was something that I wanted to bring to my non-academic work as well. So for me, um, it was both strategic and sort of personally gratifying to make sure I still had connections to that academic world as I was kind of finding my post-PhD footing. And, and so one of the ways I did that was um, through both organizing and um, getting involved with different kinds of alternative affiliations. Um, and so that took a lot of forms. So for example, uh, I am in New York City. I finished my PhD here, uh, was here um, between PhD and my current role and, and have stayed here for my current role. Um, and one of the things that I uh, really enjoyed was just the absolute sort of blossoming of science and technology studies kind of affiliated or surrounding scholarship. So, you know, how do I make that a community? Um, you know, I started a, a listserv, for example, that included not only researchers, but also practitioners. And, and that's still going today. Um, we haven't met as much during the pandemic, but, um, you know, that's a kind of informal space that takes very little infrastructure. It's just one person sending email messages every so often, um, but that has um, been a really sort of generative community. Um, kind of on the margins of scholarly societies, one project uh, that I uh, worked on for a couple of years, hopefully we'll be back post pandemic, uh, was the Wakanda University project uh, that I collaborated uh, with Elizabeth Chin at the Art Center College of Design to get up and running in 2018 and we continued in 2019. So this was a kind of collaborative exhibition demonstration. Uh, collaboration space that took place uh, at two years of the American Anthropological Association meetings. Um, and that was one where we created a, a kind of um, parallel space as a kind of adjunct to the main meeting. So the first year, uh, we actually rented a booth in the exhibition area and set up space for um, sort of artistic and design interventions on um, uh, anthropological themes. And the second year we collaborated with the Ethnographic Terminalia Collective um, in a kind of off um, conference space, uh, but that received some funding both from uh, the institutions that faculty uh, involved were affiliated with, as well as the Society for Visual Anthropology. So again, there was some kind of, you know, semi-alternative spaces that kind of benefit from the proximity to a big society and a big meeting as well. So those are just kind of two examples. There are definitely others that I've been involved with, but I think they'll speak to some of the models that Marcel uh, was starting to highlight for us. Dylan, do you maybe want to jump in here as the president of a, of a society, the American Studies Association, and how maybe that, you know, the uh, official and alternative spaces may have kind of overlapped in the last year. Absolutely. So I, I'll say this, um, and, and I'm going to, if, if you all tolerate it, I'm going to insert some resources uh, as links uh, in the chat throughout throughout our session together, throughout our conversation together. I'll try, to, I'll try not to inundate everybody all at once with them. Uh, but I'll say this, American Studies Association seems over the time I've been part of it, which has been since the mid 90s, it seems to have actually developed a culture it seems to have developed the, 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 the culture and the infrastructure of what Marcel's report names as an alternative space of affiliation. In other words, it's a major, it's a major scholarly professional organization. Um, but at the same time, the way in which not just the annual meetings are conducted, but um, its committee work is conducted, its decision making, um, its, kind of, its public facing work is conducted. Um, uh, the kind of ethic of everything from the sliding scale membership and conference fees to um, this caucus structure, which I'll talk about in a second, has, uh, uh, I think, in kind of principle of, 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 of two things that are reflected in the report's recommendations. One is kind of privileging um, an assessment and the vulnerabilities of early career people, um, people who are contingent faculty members, increasingly people who are contingent faculty members, uh, and people who, who inhabit positions of structural systemic, uh, you know, marginality, vulnerability, et cetera, right? So um, Black colleagues, by Indigenous colleagues, uh, disabled colleagues, and whatnot. So, so all this, the, the kind of principles 
that that actually animate ASA are, are, are guided by by that membership, which has actually kind of taken it over. So there was, I remember when I was in graduate school, there was a kind of moment of clear transition between, you know, the, 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 the older rendition of the American Studies Association and what's become the American Studies Association. And, and I remember kind of hearing about it as what you could loosely call a kind of ethnic studies, gender studies takeover, queer studies takeover, right, a coup. Of, of America. And, and the coup was, of course, it wasn't just the leadership and who got elected president, it was the membership. It was what, what constituted the panels. Um, okay, so I, I give you all that, all that loose background to contextualize my first statement, which is to which is say that, that scholars go, or especially early career scholars, um, go to ASA both as a primary professional organization, but also as an alternative space of, of affiliation, again, to use Marcel's language. Um, many people retain their professional membership in large disciplinary academic organizations. So, so a good number of people have um, you know, their annual memberships in organizations like MLA, like AHA, like professional geographers associations, and so forth, you know, American Sociology Association, triple, triple S, uh, sorry, uh, SSSP, it's so, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of our members, retain those kind of large disciplinary academic professional organizational um, memberships, but also, you know, I, I put it yesterday in our pre-conversation, they flee to the ASA every year, right? Which is, which is part of this tension that I'm getting at that actually constitutes what ASA is. It's, it's, it's you know, to, to cite my, my friend and colleague, colleagues, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, right? It, it, it's, it's experienced and inhabited as, as a kind of fugitive place for a lot of scholars um, for a lot of the reasons that are outlined in, in the report. Um, um, you know, actually for every reason and more that are outlined in the report. So people go to ASA for that. So, so it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of way to frame the work that we're doing because, you know, on the one hand, ASA is depending how you define these terms, it's the largest and most robustly interdisciplinary scholarly organization in the world. Thousands and thousands of members, you know, and it's constantly changing. It's a membership driven organization. I think we have basically one and a half staff paid and everything else is, is kind of the leadership and service labor of, of, um, of its members. Um, um, and the last thing I'll point out that I think is a really concrete way that, that the ASA has made, um, has made, has made support for early career people, including graduate students, a central part of its actual infrastructure, right? So when I say when I say ASA's culture, I don't just mean this kind of ephemeral abstracted notion of culture. I mean, the infrastructure of the organization, right? Because I don't think you have, I don't think you have a culture without an infrastructure that reproduces or supports that culture. So when I'm saying that, when I say culture, I mean the infrastructure. Part of the infrastructure, and I'll put the link right now in, in the chat, is this. Um, and I'll say this has supported me from the time I was a grad student to now. It's the caucus structure, right? Anybody, anybody who's in the ASA can propose the creation of a new caucus. It could be four graduate students, right? Four first-year graduate students can propose a caucus. And in fact, some of them have origins in something not far from that, in a, in a cohort of grad students not far from, from being that early in their careers. But if you look at the caucus structure, it's, it's that infrastructure that... that um, foregrounds and privileges early career scholars. Uh, it puts their work at the forefront. It gives them the kind of traction and the juice to pull senior scholars into their work, you know, whether it's as respondents to their panels, right? Whether it's, it's um, as, as co-participants in, in, in featured sessions during the annual meeting, um, whether it's, you know, um, pulling people together for special journal issues of the flagship journal, American Quarterly. So, you know, th those kind of, you know, kind of prominent projects, you know, kind of um, outward facing high profile projects that support early career scholars are driven by these caucuses. Um, and, you know, the caucuses meet uh, both during the annual meeting, but they also also meet throughout the year. In fact, they're given um, some privileges in the annual meeting organizing process to actually create uh, sequ uh, sequential sessions. So they'll actually be featured in the annual meeting as you know, the X caucus session, and it'll and it'll be highlighted, and people will go to that. And so that actually builds that infrastructure up further, and more people join these caucuses. So the one that I was most actively part of, and um, and, and remain actively part of, is a carceral studies one. Um, a bunch of abolitionist colleagues basically started this thing, and I was part of that founding group, uh, and 
over the years, we've generated all kinds of creative stuff, uh, both, both within and beyond the ASA's annual meeting. And it's been overwhelmingly the early career scholars, which is both, by the way, that's good and it's bad, right? I, I'm harping on all the things that are supported for early career scholars here. Um, it gets people out there, it, it gets their names, it, shoot, it gets some jobs and postdocs because we know who somebody is from the first time that we, you know, that we see them as a first or second year graduate student. So I've seen that. I've been around long enough to actually see that happen, right? People get, you know, postdocs because we know who they are. They are. Some of us are on those committees. Um, we highlight the file. Shoot, for jobs, the same thing. You, we all know how that works, right? Um, but at the same time, I think the, 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 the critique I would have about this infrastructure is that at times it is overly reliant on, on the labor, um, on the energy of early career scholars. And, and you know, it's, it's a zero sum game, right? Because some of the high profile people, some of the senior people are inundated with all kinds of other service commitments, all kinds of other mentorship and whatnot. So, and, and you know, I'm part of that group now, right? So, so, I'll, so I'll say that, yeah, I mean, a lot of times the, the sense is that, okay, the caucus is, is the early career people's game. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think that there's another side of that I would say that, that, that that the early career folks are end up being the ones who do a lot of the kind of organizing and administrative labor for that. So, so I think that there's two sides to all of this. Um, but I, but I am proud of the way that that ASA has been very principled um, and explicit about about understanding how the shape of these interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and antidisciplinary critical fields uh, is 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 and probably you know for the foreseeable future will be. Um, uh, built and transformed and intervened on constantly by by people who we would define as early career scholars, meaning people that are pre tenure or maybe very recently tenured. Um, so I see the ASA as, as as really constituted by that energy and by those folks, and so the infrastructure has you know become uh, something that that organically reflects that. Can I can I respond to part of his comment, quick duty? Sure. Then I want to uh, bring in Elaine because I uh, are on infrastructure, but please. Sure. Yeah. Um, but but I just wanted to, you know, I, I'm so glad you pointed out the kind of the the good and the bad of this kind of centering of early career researchers and especially graduate students still in. Um, and I wanted to kind of add on to that. So, you know, I'm speaking again from a position of multiple years of precarity in the academy. You know, I've been an adjunct. I've worked in um, kind of alternative academic spaces. Um, I love working in those spaces. It's hard to make a living there. Um, and my current position um, is a contract position, right? So non-tenure track. Um, and I'm also gonna have two books come out next year, right? So, which would be, you know, well, uh, you know, would, would be well more than enough to sort of gain, gain tenure um, in any field in the humanities or social sciences, um, you know, 10 years or more ago, uh, five years after getting a PhD. But, um, you know, I, I've had, I've never actually even interviewed for a tenure track job, right? So. Um, so I, I think I think also part of the the kind of rub of the kind of model you're pointing out is that the carrot of this level of intensive involvement in a scholarly society, the carrot of going on and getting a tenure track job, simply doesn't exist in some fields, right? And and we were talking about this yesterday. So in the kind of narrower slice of anthropology, of, of medical anthropology, that is kind of my specialty, um, you know, in any given year, the top handful dozen or a couple dozen programs are easily graduating, uh, you know, 100 new PhDs. Um, I completely ignored the job cycle this year, but last year when I was still paying attention to it, there were, I think, about five or six tenure track jobs and maybe a dozen full-time jobs total in medical anthropology, right? Not only for those hundred people from top programs, but also for basically a decade's worth of, of people in the kind of backlog for a, a long-term full-time position like me, right? So I think there's also this larger question um, uh, of, you know, well, why are, again, getting back to Marcel's question, right? Well, why would I participate, right? If I, if I kind of know the odds um, that are out there. And I think that's something we really struggle with in anthropology. Um, STS is a little bit different because there are kind of multiple pathways and it depends a lot on kind of what is your country uh, or region of origin and where you're seeking to get a job, right? So STS job markets look very different in Europe, uh, are more robust in some ways, but kind of only to a certain point. Um, in the US, you know, they look um, similar uh, to 
anthropology, but STS people can sometimes go into a traditional discipline like sociology uh, with a lot more opportunities or public health or, or public policy. So um, again, this also kind of varies a lot by discipline, but I think a big part of the why uh, of, of Marcel's interaction at the top was, uh, you know, anthropology is in a particularly bad place uh, and it raises uh, serious questions about uh, the labor of graduate students in societies. So thank you. So I'd love to bring Elena to this question as a library leader, listening to these questions about infrastructure and you know, and Marcel's recommendation around supporting community, this labor question. I would just love to hear your thoughts about where you think the opportunities are. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, societies and libraries are both mission-driven organizations. And I think to me, the issue always comes down to control of scholarly um, content and who determines what is scholarship and what is good scholarship. And I think that to me is a, a, a really challenging question. And so I think about libraries as, as the institution that is about access and preserving the scholarly record for future generations. Um, I also think about my role as really like I'm my number one priority are the researchers at my institution, right? So I focus on UNC Chapel Hill, but I also know when I go to work at 8 a.m. in the morning, the people who are there waiting for the libraries to open are the independent scholars. And they're there at 8 a.m. And that's how I've gotten to know them because we're, we're all there at 8 a.m. waiting to get in the library. Um, but I also would, you know, like to talk about the fact that we're such a major stakeholder in the future of um, scholarship and the role of societies. And so as the primary source of funding for journals, you know, we pay the bills, like we pay for the journals that the societies um, publish. And I believe that that role has been taken for granted and that there's this assumption that, you know, libraries are just, you know, we're gonna always do this. And now the economics and the reality of the system that we have, the scholarly communication system, which is deeply inequitable in every way from the production of knowledge, the review of knowledge, impact factors, peer review, all of these systems are deeply inequitable and they create a system where the incentives are all wrong. The incentives and the core part of this inequitable system is, a, is the system of promotion and tenure which um, we know is, uh, is problematic and which drives these behaviors and incentives that are not good for humanity. They're not good for innovation. And they're not good for higher ed. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the um, NIH and NSF and all these funders are, are funded by the taxpayers, yet taxpayers don't have access to those research um, articles and, and data sets is just, you know, it's just so problematic. And I realize, of course, not all research is funded by the NSF and, and, and NIH. Um, and then finally, I would like to say that, um, you know, libraries are just so invested in libraries, I, I'm sorry, in societies, because we believe that societies are really important, um, but they're also part of this whole ecosystem. And, and for many years, the libraries really just focused on the big publishing houses, you know, the multinational companies like Elsevier, Springer, Wiley. And we've neglected to focus on societies. And, and so I'm spending a lot more time talking with societies directly through the faculty on my campus, but also just directly um, reaching out to them to find out ways for us to engage because um, if we if we completely ignore the societies, we're never going to get to this issue of who should control the scholarly ecosystem and for what benefit. Uh, thank you, Dylan. Did you want to respond to that? You have something in the chat about uh, just the disappearance of the carrot in the ASA. I'm intrigued. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to just amplify what both Daniel and Elaine were talking about with. Um, you know, the, ad, the adjunctification of, of, of academic labor, of scholarly labor, and of teaching labor in universities um, across the United States and around the world. And, and the fact that, you know, I think, I think most, most scholarly societies are late or in a kind of state of willful ignorance um, about that fact um, that they're insisting on 
organizing everything they do around these 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 golden carrots that don't exist. Um, and in fact, that's that's something that 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 American Studies Association has been been talking and thinking about. We actually have like an entire committee that's just devoted to adjunct and contingent faculty, right? So like we actually try to plan parts of the conference to both deal concretely with the material conditions, institutional conditions that that you know the vast majority of faculty at these institutions that we're from um, actually inhabit and navigate every day. But we're also trying to think about how to ethically involve graduate students in this um, so-called professional life knowing that what lies ahead for the majority of them is not gonna be a tenure track position, right? At any institution, not just at a research or an our so-called R1 institute, at any institution. Um, so so we're, for, we're starting to foreground that increase. Now, I actually think that we're, you know, I think we're too slow with it, but we're actually way ahead of the game compared to almost every other professional scholarly society. Um, so before, before COVID ruined our lives, um, the, the 2020 annual meeting, we were actually gonna have um, the equivalent of a really, uh, I, I, th I think multi-faceted, um, what you wanna call it a job fair or something like that, right? But we were, we were inviting people from all over the spectrum, like from NGOs to the 501c3s to nonprofits, community organizations to museums to, you know, performance spaces and all that. Like we're, we're inviting, you know, people from a whole swath of, of um, non-academic uh, professions to come and, and talk to, particularly talk to early career scholars, particularly talk to graduate students. Um, because that's, that, that's the actual future that, that the, and, and it actually, and, and also, and also I think, I think in terms of going back to the notion of um, institutional culture, I mean, the thing that we talked about is how we have to stop engaging with graduate students as if the tenure track carrot is even a thing. That's going to be the necessary shift. Right, I, I would argue, right, that, that, that we have to stop thinking about people who enter PhD programs as necessarily um, tracked into tenure track jobs, that, that we have to have a more robust and open and progressive understanding of what lies at the other end of the PhD for people. So I think associations can actually lead with, with that, can they exemplify that is what I'm trying to say, right? If we actually are saying, yeah, you do your PhD, you don't, you, you know, tenure track jobs, one thing you can do, there's all this other stuff you can do. And also to kind of destigmatize that, which is, you know, I think part of that's generational, right? Like there's a lot of folks who still insist that no, A number one is going to be to track my grad students into tenure track jobs at R1 institutions. That's, that's part, that's, that's one of the things that's going to be difficult to dislodge, but we're actually, again, I think, I think part of the way you dislodge and transform that is just by exemplifying it and also showing some success with it, which is happening. And I'll repost the link. I apologize. I think I only posted it to the panelists. Oh, thank you. I wonder if um, Marcel or Daniel want to, you know, just as um, uh, people who have found who are at this stage of your career outside of that track, um, want to respond to that or what uh, insights you have to share. I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that is, is that, um, you know, as we're thinking beyond tenure track, postdocs are not the solution, right? They, they just extend all the problems of graduate school. Uh, it's been pretty, uh, pretty frustrating as an early career researcher to see so much growth in postdocs and, and continued scaling back in all kinds of full-time uh, positions. But uh, otherwise, I co-sign everything you say, Dylan, and actually love to uh, connect after the panel and uh, see if we can figure so something out here. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that, that um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that thinking about how, right, so, so I think that is a structural challenge for associations um, where, where, the, where the service labor that allows associations to do what they do, right? So, so there's often, and at larger associations, there's professionalized staff labor, um, and, and um, you know, that, that creates certain conditions of possibility to sort of have things done, um, yeah, I mean, sort of an institutional continuity, um, you know, and also I think a, an instinct toward institutional self-preservation, right? That, that there's a sense in which, um, yeah, th this, is, this is something that alternative spaces 
get to be loosely institutionalized because they don't have staff on payroll, right? And so I think I think that's something we have to name. I think that's something that that we have to think about as far as the labor within scholarly associations. And so how do we how do we value that labor and appreciate it? Um, and also ask when it forecloses certain kinds of conversations about um, the structure of scholarly societies and 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 their their um, scope for 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 reinventing themselves. Um, but I think when we talk about about volunteer labor or service labor, right? I mean, I, for me, this is really predicated on the idea that you have a job that that pays the bills, right? And then in excess of that, right? Or, or as part of your, you know, the, the breakdown of your contract, one, one thing that you can do is to sort of engage in, in unpaid um, service to an association. And so, yeah, I think that, that as the, the jobs that are sort of anchoring um, society members change, I think absolutely, this is sort of a question, you know, how, how does that, how does the expectation of service look different for people in precarious roles? How does the expectation of service look different for people working in industry or elsewhere? We're, we're articulating the value of scholarly societies, um, you know, to those institutions is something that they're that they're often having to, to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that, that we're centering that. And just the, the one the one other thing I'll add, maybe just uh, I'm seeing a question in the Q&A that I, I just wanted to, to speak to um, about sort of increased calls by early career researchers for societies to put their values into action. Um, so, you know, this is something that um, the report addressed pretty directly um, in one of the, the recommendations to societies. Um, yeah, in, in terms of really thinking about partnerships um, in, a, in a value centered and value forward way. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that was a, a, you know, a finding across the, the interviews, really, in talking to earlier career researchers, um, you know, that, that the sorts of partnerships that societies engage in, um, you know, uh, send messages, right, to, to, um, to researchers at all career stages, um, but certainly early career researchers who are navigating this sort of ecology of affiliation and deciding what, where to, to invest their time. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think the, the, that choice of partnerships matters and the, the last kind of plug I'll make is sort of around involving early career researchers in governance, right? I think that, that goes to sort of Dylan's point about infrastructure, right? So, so are there, yeah, are the governance processes that, that organizations have, um, adequate to, to, to engage in the kind of consultation um, that we might that we might want to see with early career researchers, and, and I think some of the yeah, I, I would say that was another finding for the interviews is that that there's room to sort of think creatively about about governance, right? So not just about revenue diversification, right, which is often sort of where we where we go or where we start, um, but really about governance as well. Yeah, I'll add on. on sorry. sorry, just on the governance point, you know, I've I've seen too frequently. Um, you know, the, the, the revenue pressures, especially around membership and journal subscriptions as a reason why governance can't change as well, right? So um, as much as getting people involved in governance is, is good, um, you know, revenue is, is too often used as an excuse for why actually nothing can change. Well, I just want to add part of the challenge of these golden carrots that don't exist is, you know, between 2000 and 2010, the publications just exploded. I mean, in some areas, they quadrupled because of the internet and the way it um, made publishing um, much more um, efficient. And now we continue to see increases in the number of published journals. Every year it goes up, every year. <laughs> On this flip side, in the press world, the number of monographs that are able to be published is not going up, right? And so, as part of that promotion and tenure process, it's like publish, 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 yet the um, venues and platforms that you're able to use are not necessarily growing at the same rate. And so we, what we have is people who are publishing more than ever and they're still not getting tenure, they're still not getting tenure track jobs, they're still, you know what I mean? And so that's one point I wanted to make. The other point, when we talk about hidden labor is the, the, the library. I mean, the, the problem is, these publications are seen as free goods. And when they're free goods, 
um, produced by a profession that is um, dominated by um, women, you know, it becomes undervalued. And so the work of the cataloging, making it available in the catalog, all those things are hidden. The cost, most scholars do not know that, you know, you can join a society, pay $200 and you get that journal. Well, I'm paying like $10,000 for that journal and I'm making it available. And so those costs are hidden, the labor is hidden. And I think that's part and parcel of the, the problems that we have. And then finally, you know, when I think about the early career researchers, since they're not joining these societies, the only way they're going to get access is through the library, right? And so now we're trying to figure out, well, now there's more pressure to deliver um, that content because um, they may not, you know, the assumption was that they were in the society and that they would get it anyway. And so we could slash our titles and not have an impact as we thought. But now with the, the way that things are changing, I've heard directly that the, that the library subscribing to these titles is important um, more than ever. Thank you. We've got about four minutes left. So I wonder if we want to just do like a lightning round of last thoughts that you want to kind of leave the leave the audience with. And um, maybe we'll start with you, Dylan. Yeah, I wanted to highlight um, one of the things that that I think came up both in the report and, 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 and I think has been um, kind of referenced implicitly in some of our, our conversation here, which is, you know, part of the reason why folks go, you know, go to alternative um, methods and spaces of affiliation is is because they're part of emergent communities that uh, tend to be um, actively repressed um, at worst and passively misrecognized at best by a lot of professional societies. And this is in every industry, but I think it's especially egregious when it's in scholarly societies where we're supposed to be thinking critically all the time. Um, so, so I think, you know, the thing that I've learned the most since I started my term, actually since before I started my term as ASA president, during my year as the president-elect, um, what was just how much work the ASA had to do, um, and I think I'll say something, you know, I'll use a very concrete example, how much work ASA had to do to place disability justice at the center of its work, right? That, 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 that we were, the organization was kind of reproducing a lot of the worst tendencies um, that are, you know, you can analogize to other, you know, ex historically excluded and underrepresented groups and all kinds of organizations. But, but we were, the organization ASA was reproducing some of those worst tendencies in dealing with disability justice. So part of this was, was, was both actively consulting with and organizing around the concerns, um, structural, ethical, and otherwise that were articulated by a disability studies caucus. But at the same time, not relying on the Disability Studies Caucus, which is scholars, to do administrative and triage labor, right? So it's like so. Part of this was also the organization saying, "Okay, we actually have to make a commitment, um, a material, structural, and ethical commitment to making everything disability accessible, bare minimum, at every in everything we do, right? Um, uh, from from annual meeting to any public facing thing we do, it has to be centering disability justice. And then and it's so it's a it's a pretty comprehensive. It's a pretty comprehensive reassessment of the entire organization. So I've been kind of both in, you know, in a leadership position, but also a kind of active learner around fixing some of this stuff, um, addressing and transforming some of this stuff and interrupting it. So I think that's the kind of thing that um, scholarly societies have to do if they're, if they're going to actually address the concerns that push early career scholars away from them to begin with. Now, I'm, I don't have faith or optimism that most scholarly organizations are going to do that, right? But I don't care because ASA does do it, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, like we're actually here for those scholars. And again, we're not perfect it, at, by far from it, right? But the, but the fact of the matter is that that kind of criticism is part of what actually animates an organization. I see a lot of other scholarly organizations where that kind of criticism, especially when it comes from the grassroots, gets no traction at all. Right. And here it actually creates a productive crisis when stuff like that bubbles up from graduate students. I'm not just talking from like the high profile people. Last thing I'll put out there, um, this is one more link I'll put out there because I think it'll be it'll be productive for folks to see it. But, you know, one of the adjustments that we made last year because we had to cancel the in-person annual meeting um, was I started this initiative called the ASA Freedom Courses, which was 100 percent open access. It was drawing from the intellectual creativity and labor of our members. 
Um, Y'all can click on that link and see the playlist. But but what it, what it what it was was pulling together people's intellectual energy to actually address the crisis that we were kind of, you know, unevenly inhabiting. Um, but but which also uh, kind of reflected the best of what the annual meeting was trying to do. So I think this is this is also about generating platforms rather than just relying on them, right? Um, I think this is something that came up in the report as well. Is it's and, and by the way, what you see here is the attempt to actually engage with disability justice. Like we had to figure out how do we how do we get at people, and I and I hate to say it, senior scholars in particular, um, who have no kind of familiarity or really literacy in dealing with disability except disability justice and accessibility to do these freedom courses. So like we had to walk through all that, right? And, and it, we still do, we still are walking through all that. So I think part of this is 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 to say that we can't just um societies can't just rely on other people and other um institutions and you know and other business models if you want to put it that way to have already existing platforms we have to actually generate them and so this is just one example of what we're trying to do and, and i hope people will get some out of it you last thing i'll say the reason we did this was because we wanted to free our faculty our faculty colleagues especially contingent faculty we wanted to give them stuff they could use in the classroom when they're online doing these zoom things to give themselves a you know a, a one-day vacation from staring at a screen Right, we were like use these freedom courses in place of a lecture and have your students talk about them. That was one of the things that like we made explicit in the call for people to contribute to them. I have a lot more to say about shut up. <laughs> so we are unfortunately out of time. So I do want to just thank the all of the panelists for your wonderful com comments and for um, and the audience for for joining us today. If you have a couple of minutes, um, we can stop the recording and um, and. Uh, you know, if if the if panelists can can hang around for a couple more minutes, we can you know engage more with the chat. But I did just want to formally say thank you at the end of the hour and for everyone that participated. I think that was a really rich discussion, and I look forward to more such conversation and exchange. So uh, I think Angela, we can stop the recording.